Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big aviation session at the World Travel Market. It's the single and hopefully the most interesting aviation session at the show this year. I'm John Strickland. I'm very happy to be back again to chair the session today. Hopefully you've all been having a good day so far. We've got some great panelists today. We're going to look particularly at the theme of the opportunities for women in the industry and especially at a senior level. The industry's got some work to do to catch up there to have both higher levels of representation of women and to take the opportunity of using the talent uh, available in that part of the workforce. We're going to have about 45 minutes or so to talk to the, the guests today, but first of all, I'm just going to run through a few slides just to give you my perspectives on where the industry is today and where it's going as we come out of COVID. So let's kick off with that. Well, I think most of you will know we've had a really challenging summer this year, all based on manpower, and it's not confined to one part of the industry. We've had this with airlines, airports and handlers. And if any of you live in the UK or follow the UK media, you could be fooled for thinking it was only a, a UK problem, possibly only a, a Heathrow problem or an EasyJet problem or a British Airways problem. But this has been common, not only in the UK, but throughout Europe, throughout the US, Australia, and pretty well every country that's seen a strong return in traffic. There's been grisly headlines about massive delays at airports, flights being cancelled at the last minute, people missing holidays, missing family events. It's really been pretty chaotic. It's not what the industry would have wanted. We would have wanted to see the demand come back strongly like this after COVID because that's been the positive side. It's come back much more quickly than we could ever have dreamed of, but the ability to handle it has proved to be much more difficult. And I think what has really caught people out was the fact that uh, so many people have left the industry and decided they wouldn't come back after the uh, pandemic started to subside. Now, I mentioned strong demand. It's not uniform, but uh, the two key areas are Europe, intra-European travel, particularly, for example, from North to South Europe for leisure, beach holidays has been very strong. So too has been the transatlantic market. If we think just a year ago, we were only just starting to see transatlantic travel begin again as both US and European citizens were able to traverse the Atlantic. So that's been a massive turnaround. Asia has been mainly closed up until the last month or so. We're now starting to see some reopening in countries like uh, Singapore, Thailand, even Hong Kong, which was always a global uh, hotspot as a destination and a major hub as an airport is beginning to open up. But China overall remains firmly closed and we have no clue as to when that will open. So airline performance has been very much driven by where do they fly? If they've been fortunate to be in these major recovering markets, they've performed well, and if not, they're still waiting for that opportunity. And we've had a lot of airline results just coming out very recently. Some results have been very, very strong. Now, don't worry about all the detail on these slides here, but these are the three pages from Lufthansa Group, IAG, the parent company of British Airways, and our guest today, Air Lingus, and Air France KLM Group. They've all announced profits for the last quarter, which was the peak summer period. Their capacity is getting back up to close to where it was pre-pandemic on all those markets that I mentioned, not, of course, on Asia. Uh, interesting to see if, if we do look at the bottom right uh, part of the slide there, Lufthansa talks about yield, the average ticket price being up 23%. And even this morning, Ryanair, they announced also strong profitability for the first half of the year. And as a low fare airline, even their average price was up, I think it was 11 or 12%, they said today. Now, not everyone has made money in, in this uh, last peak period of summer, and one of our guest airlines today, Wizz Air, perhaps surprisingly, is one of those who did declare a pretty hefty loss for the last quarter. But it's really for a very specific region, which, uh, reason, which I'll come on to in a, a bit more detail in a few minutes. It's the price of fuel. Uh, Wizz had not hedged on fuel. They hadn't bought fuel ahead at a pre-agreed price before prices began to rocket late last year as we saw air travel demand recover. And of course, once the Ukraine conflict began, fuel prices really went extremely high. So Wizz has been hit by that. At the same time, they've been growing in terms of traffic. Now, as I mentioned, their, their fellow low-cost carrier Ryanair, who had hedged heavily on fuel before these fuel price challenges began, is sitting pretty at the moment on much lower fuel prices, uh, thanks to their decision to do that much earlier. And if we look at this very uh, handy slide, I think, from Eurocontrol, at how airlines have performed. The recovery which we've seen here in Europe has certainly not been uniform. Now here, Ryanair 
not only in profitability but in volume is running well ahead of 2019 levels. WIS is also significantly ahead of the same period in 2019, but they're pretty well the only airlines that have seen growth. They've been taking the opportunities to put on more capacity, they've been adding to their fleets, opening new routes and opening new bases. Even EasyJet, who will put their year-end results out at the end of this month, they're still down by about 20%. And most of the network groups that I referred to just now in profitability terms are not yet back to full capacity, mainly because they're all exposed to Asia uh, and the capacity, of course, has not got back, gone back in there in the way that it has on the, the North Atlantic. Turkish Airlines is, is down slightly, but they, they've also exploited quite a lot the opportunity to grow. They also have a new unconstrained airport in Istanbul, and they've been putting a lot of uh, additional flights and destinations on there with a growing fleet. Now, the shape of demand is quite interesting. It's coming back somewhat differently to what it was pre-COVID, leisure and VFR traffic. And VFR, for those who don't know the abbreviation, visiting friends and relation traffic, has been very, very important. This is where we've seen the pent-up demand, people who haven't been able to travel on holiday, haven't been able to see friends and family for the last two or three years, all eager to travel, all who've saved up money from not being able to spend on many things during the pandemic, very keen to travel, and that's been keeping the airlines buoyed up through the spring and summer this year. As we look now, it's still looking strong into the early part of winter for the same reason, forward bookings of uh, these market segments remain very, very strong indeed. Business traffic itself is still down. Most airlines are reporting around about 25% lower volumes in business travel. But perhaps the surprise is that the business cabin occupancy on long haul flights has been very high. And that's been driven more by a trend in premium leisure. Many people have wanted to travel. They splashed out having not flown for a couple of years and spent the money to go a bit more comfortably in a premium cabin. Maybe there's also a feeling amongst people they'd rather make sure they have space around them. And so those cabins have been very, very full, partly feeding through to the, the higher price averages that we've seen from airlines like Lufthansa. But corporate travelers are still down. And I think that's something which is probably going to play out over quite a lot longer period in terms of recovery, because many people have realized they can use online conferencing just as easily as traveling. But of course, face-to-face -face is still going to be a very important factor for doing business. So I think more recovery will come there. The outlook beyond this pretty strong summer is quite uncertain. Of course, the UK is now talking, the Bank of England uh, last week said a, a very long recession, probably the longest ever seen in the UK, likely to extend to two years. Winter bookings, as I mentioned, are OK so far. But next summer, nobody really has a clue what we can expect at that time. We've got to face the high fuel prices that I mentioned. Fuel is still running at record high levels. We haven't seen levels like this for you know, 15 years or so. They're really, really high. And even with hedging, airlines are still finding that it's a very high cost to bear where they can try to pass it on in pricing. UK inflation is also at levels we haven't seen for decades. And consumers are suffering there with high gas bills, high domestic bills of every kind you can think of, grocery prices. And that leaves the question about what money will be available to travel next year. And it's not just the UK. This is true in a number of other countries as well. We've also seen an exceptional strong dollar, both against the pound and against the euro. And in terms of airline expenses, as we see in this chart from IATA, that is challenging because fuel costs are dollar denominated, as are aircraft lease costs as well, and many other costs that airlines can't avoid. So it gives a big cost burden to airlines when they lose out on the exchange rate as they are currently doing. The war in Ukraine sadly is still with us and no sign that that's going to end anytime soon. That's had the biggest effect for airlines uh, who typically flew over Russian airspace, Siberian airspace as the fastest route to Asia. Now it's been less significant because of the Asian markets not being open until now, but as they start to open, Airlines have to fly massively circuitous routings around Siberia from Europe to the Far East to many destinations, adding anything from two to four hours to flying time. And one airline who seemed to have a, an unbreakable strategy pre-COVID was Finnair, using their geographic position up in the north of Europe to be a perfect staging post between Europe and Asia, uh, and using very modern long-range aircraft to fly numerous routes to not only uh, multiple Asian countries, but multiple cities in China specifically. 
that strategy has been well and truly shot out of the window. As they say on this slide from their recent investor presentation, we do not have a unique geographical advantage anymore. They've had to ground aircraft, lease aircraft out to other airlines, take government loans, and completely rethink their strategy because their geography doesn't permit them, for example, to fly massively transatlantic in any meaningful way in the way that another European network group might be able to do. So this is a problem that is going to be with us for quite some time. And Eurocontrol, again, uh, produces market forecasts of traffic, demand, looking the years ahead. They have recently downgraded their recovery forecast to 2024, 2025, before they expect in their base case to get back to the same level of traffic activity in total as we saw pre-COVID. In the worst case, we could still well be below it, but certainly doesn't, doesn't look like we're going to recover much above it anytime soon. The environment, of course, is a topic which uh, not only uh, this week with uh, the COP meeting taking place, COP27, it's one which aviation is very much implicated in, which the industry is trying to do its best to address in a very uh, serious way. IATA agreed in the last year, the industry trade body, to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. That has been endorsed positively by governments through the recent uh, ICAO meeting. But in terms of technological developments, these are a long way off making a big difference to air travel. Whether we look at hydrogen power or electric power, it's going to be decades before these can be used in a very wide sense. Perhaps into the next decade, maybe a little bit before, we'll see that starting to come through in regional aircraft. For example, up in Sweden, we have the Hart Aerospace producing a 30-seat small regional aircraft which will be able to be used on small uh, local routes that can be powered by uh, electric propulsion. Hydrogen may start to appear mid-2030s uh, according to work that Rolls-Royce and Airbus are doing, but long-haul flights are going to have to rely on alternative fuel to kerosene, sustainable aviation fuel to really uh, move ahead and cut emissions through the life cycle of fuel production and there's just not enough of that being produced right now, so a lot needs to be done to push the agenda forward. And last but not least, on the environmental agenda, we also got a bit of a shock news recently from the Dutch government who decided they were going to put a permanent cap of capacity on Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Now, Amsterdam, not only the home of the KLM side of Air France KLM, but a major tool in the Dutch economy, a small population, but a big airport system offering worldwide connections. It was a shock to the airport and the airline that the government proposes to cut capacity below pre-pandemic levels on a permanent basis. Now, that's not definitely going to happen as yet. There's a lot of EU legal challenges that it may face, but it just shows governments could be willing to step in and interfere in air travel volumes. So that's my quick snapshot on where we've got to right now. Uh, so thanks for your attention on, on that. Uh, we're moving on to another theme, and I'm now going to ask my uh, guests today, they'd like to start making their way to the stage, and I'll introduce them as they st step up. So, women leaders, please make your way to the stage. Women in aviation, a nice round of applause for them as they come. As I mentioned, we do not have enough women in the industry at all levels, uh, least of all leadership. IATA, the industry body, says 9% of airlines around the world have airline CEOs. We have about 5% of the pilot force is uh, women and 9% of engineers amongst other functions. So I'm really pleased today that we've got three women who have not only had long careers in the industry, but they've made it to the top. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Lynn Embleton from Aer Lingus. Lynn is CEO of Aer Lingus. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. And next to Lynn, we have Marianne, and here's my French to be, to be tested, Marianne Geoffroy. Marianne also has had a long career in the industry, first of all with uh, Air France KLM Group and currently Managing Director of Wizz Air UK. So Marianne, welcome to you. Thank you. And far right, we have Dawn Wilson, also a lady who's had a, a long career in the industry. Dawn is now COO of TUI Airline in Europe. So Dawn, welcome to you. Thank you. First of all, can you, are your mics all on? I guess you, you are. Should we Hello. talk? Hello. Yep, good. Yep. Lynn, let's, let's start with you. We were have, having a little chat the other day and you actually told me that you, you weren't looking to start in aviation and yet you now have had a long career in aviation. Give me a bit of a flavour of that prior yeah. to joining Aer Lingus. Well, it was meant to last two years, I thought, um, and it was 30 last month, <laughs> so it didn't quite go to plan at all, really. Um, I did a maths degree and I didn't want to be an accountant and there was no 
Uh, there was nothing in the career service that said what you could do with maths if you didn't want to be an accountant. Uh, so I stumbled into uh, doing operational research, which is like maths for business. Um, and I joined British Airways and I thought, I'll give this a go for two years. Um, and it turns out that this industry is a lot more interesting uh, than it seemed to be from the outside. And um, I haven't been bored and kept doing new things and I'm still here. Did you have an idea what you did want to do? Was there something you had in mind using that maths? No, academic, no, not at all. Um, my general philosophy was uh, enjoy yourself um, and do something that you're finding challenging and as soon as it stops being challenging, move on and do something else. But the aviation industry and airline is so broad um, that I found I can keep doing new things um, and still feeling that I'm learning new stuff and, and feeling I'm developing. So. Uh, uh, yeah, 30 years and still in the industry. A long time, a long time. And a lot of different experiences in terms of the male-female dynamics. So I'll ask you a bit more about that in a, in a minute, Lynn. Okay. Marion, how about you? Did you want to get into airlines? Because yours was, again, a different route. I did want to go into airlines. Yeah. I knew this very, at a very young age. Um, I graduated as an aviation lawyer and uh, was lucky enough to start my <laughs> career as an aviation lawyer with Air France, which then became Air France KLM. And, uh, and, and it's my, probably now my eighth or ninth role in aviation. And uh, I got to move into operations. Uh, actually got to get very close to operations this summer, fantastic. <laughs> uh, especially as I was in the UK. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's fascinating because I think you can keep learning, you keep discovering. And in, in, in a country like the UK, aviation is very dynamic, is always changing. The landscape is changing. And, uh, and this is what makes the job extremely exciting. Great, thanks, Marion. We'll come back and share more of your experiences in a minute. And Dawn, again, a different route into the industry. Did you want to get into aviation? I think I wanted to get into travel, mm -hmm. um, but I very much use the entry point into aviation as a way of not being able to afford to do a gap year. So I thought I'll go and become cabin crew, let somebody else pay for it instead. Didn't quite work out like that. But yeah, I mean, in those early days, I was cabin crew for a number of years and really enjoyed it, enjoyed the variety, you know, the customer service aspect of it. And then it was just an opportunity after an opportunity and I've never really looked back. 34 years later, same business, done lots of different things in the business and very pleased that I did take that first opportunity. Well, st sticking with you, Dawn, I mean, you, you said you've started in what maybe in a, a cliched sense is one yeah. of the areas where people might think if you're going to say where might you find a, a, a woman employee cabin crew would be one you think you, you, you would be where where many women would actually start but you've you've had this track of over 30 years just give me a flavor along the way on what you felt in terms of your own progression have you ever felt simply because of gender that you were held back uh, have you have you had situations where you felt I didn't get that job because I'm not a guy yeah no, I haven't. So, you know, I'm probably quite lucky in that respect. Um, I think in, in those early days when I was cabin crew, obviously it was a largely female uh, role and probably still is. I think we've got probably about 20% male stewards, but the majority is still female. In my days, 34 years ago, it was 99% female. Mm -hmm. And when you walked down the aircraft and you went into the flight deck, guess what? It was all guys. And I think there were two female pilots. And, you know, it, it still makes me smarter to day where they used to come over the PA and people were visibly shocked. Um, I think as I moved out of that cabin crew world and I started to move more into management, middle management and senior management jobs, it started to become more obvious to me in the 1990s that I was probably the only female in the room. Um, has it held me back from getting any jobs? No. I do remember a particularly um, difficult situation where there was probably one female director in our business, and we're talking 15 years ago, and I got talent managed into her team, and she really didn't like that. And that was quite an interesting moment in my career because I think when I look at how I bring females in and through the organization, you try and create a safe environment for them where they can flourish. And that lady definitely didn't for me, which is quite interesting mm -hmm. versus the female male um, angle. And did you ever feel there were times when you, you had to work harder to be heard and to make your case, especially as you moved into management roles, sitting around 
you know, say a boardroom table or, or have you found you've been able to uh, give as good as you get, fight on an equal basis? I think um, when I got my first board position, it was quite a loud board, quite a strong board, heavily male orientated. And I think in those first couple of meetings, I decided that it was better to join them and you know, try and be like them. And then very quickly, I had some coaching at the time. I, I learned to be more authentic and be myself. And that was probably you know, bringing something different to the table rather than just trying to be the same. And I think that's what, you know, when I'm talking to people today, I really push that authenticity, you know, bring, bring the best version of you mm -hmm. to, the, to the business, not what you think you should be like because I've seen some senior female leaders who just sometimes try to replicate behaviors that they think um, are the right ones. Well, that's something I, I wanted to ask maybe all of you. I mean, it's maybe a bit of a cliche example, but I, I've sometimes wondered, do women have to fight harder? You were talking about authenticity, just because that need to break through the testosterone-fueled world. And I'm thinking that maybe it is a caricature that Margaret Thatcher, political leader, nicknamed by some countries the, the Iron Lady, but she had to be tough. Whether you liked her or loathed her, she had to be tough. But I wonder, as a man, is that because she felt she had to in order to be able to get her and impose her authority? Or do you think that's more of an individual thing? Maybe, Marion, I'll move to you on that. So, yeah, my level of testosterone is very low, uh, but I had to fight. Yeah. Um, but to fight differently and to us, um, you were saying, yeah, it's important to remain yourself because we are complementary in how we approach things, in how we approach people, in how we approach the business itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think in aviation, all of us do fight because it's, it's complicated, it's regulated, it's going from one crisis to the other. However, as a woman, it's important you fight as a woman and you bring something uh, which will add value to the uh, to the overall group, uh, and this is the this is the beauty of diversity, whether it's gender mm -hmm. or other type of diversity. It's the it's what makes the recipe uh, 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 working. And, and Lynn, have you been able to be yourself? Have you encountered challenges to get heard? Or yeah, what I do recognise in in what Dawn said is that being the only female in the room, um, and. I moved from uh, operational research into doing scheduling and network planning and mm -hmm. fleet. And that's quite a male side of the, the management um, uh, functions. So I would normally be the only female in the room. Yeah. Um, but that, that was normal because I didn't know any better. So I don't think it was fighting as such. Mm -hmm. it, it was possibly feeling slightly odd and feeling uh, the odd one out. Right. But. Um, I don't think it particularly affected anything. It was just getting on with the, getting on with the topics, contributing to the topics. Um, uh, not, so it didn't feel hostile in any way. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel um, that it was holding back in any way, but I did feel different, mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. When you say feel different, I mean, uh, apart from gender, any more you can elaborate on that? I mean, I think thinking it, processes? I, th I think, um, uh, the, I think females do tend to open up a little bit more. They tend to say what they th they're feeling and saying what they're thinking a little bit more. And actually, that's why I think we need more diversity. I, um, in Aer Lingus, when, if you go back two years, we had one in 10 of the exec team were female. We're now at three in 10, and I would say we have good dialogue because we've got more people who are joining in an open conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to see that grow. And I think um, I'd just like to be in a a room that is more representative of the society we live in, um, and that hasn't been aviation in the past, but I think it needs to change, and I think it is changing. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking as well, I mean, especially in your time at British Airways, you worked with, for one of the guys who is known as one of the toughest guys in the industry, doesn't suffer fools gladly, calls a spade a spade. I think Willie, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, well, <laughs> the name name's Willie Walsh, obviously. <laughs> but then Willie, uh, looking at him from the outside, would only keep people in post or give post to people if he thought they were delivering. Simple as that, regardless of any other criteria. Is that a fair assessment? Because yeah. assuming you wouldn't have been there, you wouldn't now be in Aer Lingus uh, if you hadn't been delivering. As simple as that. I, I, I've got so much time for Willie because he's, he's, he's straight, straight talking, um, you know, no bullshit. Uh, he, he's demanding, he wants change. 
um, but he's high on integrity and, and open honesty as well. And yeah, that's those kind of characteristics in somebody you're working with, working for uh, later in my career. Um, that was that was a set of um, principles, values, attributes that I happen to like working for, um, and it seemed to have worked for me. And, and Marion, in, in, was there again? You have another of the industry's leaders, a tough cookie, Joseph Ferrardi. Uh, what would your observations be there? Similar to Lynn? Yes. Well, he's 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 very transparent in a way. He's. He's easy to read for, I don't know if it's a woman no, thing, but he's easy no, to angry. read as a person. Predictable, mm -hmm. tough but predictable. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's actually pleasant because, once again, uh, other uh, team members add adds what he doesn't necessarily have, which is uh, yeah, to, 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 to listen and to, uh, and, and to uh, interpret uh, other people. But he's... Uh, he's uh, He's, he's a great leader um, and, and, and very smart. And Wizes just said recently that, again, at senior levels, a bit like Lynn was saying in Aer Lingus, about a third of the senior team uh, posts are held by women now. Yeah, so yeah, currently the, uh, the, the, the female um, senior management is at 36%. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've observed as well is that women attract women. So uh, as, I, as I was appointed to, uh, to this position, uh, I received a lot of requests just for talk and explaining about my background, but also our female pilots come easily to me to talk uh, and, uh, and I've recruited more women than anyone before. So mm. it's it, the fact that we make ourselves visible and we start talking about it does attract other women. And if I can just uh, yeah. add on that, there was, I was talking to a fairly new recruit we had in our finance team. Um, and she said what attracted her to the business was she was going to be working for senior female senior manager who was working for a female chief financial officer who was working for a female CEO. Um, and that's what attracted her in. And um, I don't want every department to be like that, mm -hmm. by the way, but it's just that sense that momentum breeds momentum. Yeah. Uh, and I think we, we do need to sh show people that there is diversity in the organization so that people can feel comfortable in the organization mm -hmm. and can see themselves in the organization. So I think uh, I, I recognize what you're saying there. Is it similar in TUI, uh, Dawn, in terms yeah. of the, the rise of women uh, across the business? Yeah, I think um, at the very senior level of the organisation, you know, we are we are um, really a German business, but we've got um, you know a big European network. Um, there are more and more women bubbling to the top, quite naturally. You know, if I, if I look back to my days as cabin crew, when I became a cabin crew manager, quite naturally there was a rich thread of women coming through the cabin crew populations who were talent. So you had a, you know, a big pool to fish from there. As you get further and further up the organization, it gets thinner and thinner, um, but is getting, I think, better and better. Um, and if I look at my own team now, out of all my direct reports, I'd say 70% of them are female. And that isn't because I've gone on an active recruitment campaign of getting women into my leadership team. It's just they're the best people for the job. If I look at the level below them, we're at 50, 58, 59% female. Um, which is, is absolutely brilliant. So if you then push that up through you know, the airline part of the organization, it's going to come the, on that main board is going to be a female at some point in time. If you look at pilots, and I think that's an area that um, I don't know about you two, but you know, we really need to concentrate on. One of the areas that I'm quite interested in is you have a lot of female pilots now coming through, a lot more anyway than the two that was there when I started. Um, but they are dropping out at a certain level. And when I look at our training captains, that? well, who knows? Um, you know, that's probably a question for that community, but I would imagine it is more so to do with working environment, um, to do with um, flexibility that is needed in the job. You know, if, if I had to go home in the middle of the afternoon because my child was ill, it would be easy to leave Luton Airport and go home. It's not so easy when you're on a flight to Alicante. And you know you might have to night stop, and you might not be able to get home so quickly. So I think the flexibility that is required in aviation can perhaps, um, perhaps mentally limit some people. 
Um, so we're doing a lot more around offering part-time opportunities, offering slower returns to work after maternity, and trying to get more um, part-time opportunities to be trainers to really open up um, those the, that female lead into the most you know senior positions. And I mean positions like piloting. I mean there's a challenge anyway in recruitment in, in, in many parts of the world and in individual airlines. I was just thinking when you were talking air door and an old colleague of mine in uh, KLM's UK subsidiary he was our crewing manager yeah but his wife was a 747 captain for BA uh, so I was thinking something must have been, been able to work there in BA that she could do that career and I, I was going to ask him mean, in your, your companies Wizz Air and Aer Lingus are you facilitating this aspect that family breaks having a child maternity or the need to take your kid to a a crash or pick up the school. Yeah, yeah, we are facilitating that, whether it's uh, building rosters in a way that would facilitate life, uh, but al also, as you were mentioning, to also facilitate some transitions towards office positions, because it can happen that ultimately this is the choice, uh, and uh, we are trying to facilitate this, because there are plenty of office opportunities uh, for pilots, uh, and we try to encourage, of course, this, uh, this, this possible combination of office uh, duties mm -hmm. uh, next to uh, flying duties to, uh, to be able to have proper work-life balance. Aer Lingus, are you... Are you well, we are, if you glass half empty, we haven't got nearly enough uh, diversity in our pilot base. Mm -hmm. If you glass half full, we've got 10%, which is higher than the industry average, right. I think. Mm -hmm. um, we have brought in recently uh, more family-friendly policies, but I have to say that's also improving paternity leave. Um, so this isn't just a, a, a female issue to keep talent in the organisation. Um, and we're just working really hard to get people through the door and get them interested and demonstrate to them that there are plenty of jobs across every part of, uh, of the airline. Engineering and, and flight crew are some of the more difficult ones to attract in, but not the only ones where we struggle to attract in. Um, and we need to get the message out that it's a terrific industry to be in. Um, and and you, can, you can do a lot and it, fits with, it can fit with a flexible lifestyle if you needed to. So um, we've got a lot more work to do, um, but we're certainly making, making good progress. And, and touching on that point, as you said, getting the message out about the industry, I'll ask all of you, I mean, is there a challenge that maybe many jobs in the industry, it seems like a boy's job. I mean, I, I, I knew as a child I wanted to work in an airline. I thought I wanted to be a pilot, thank goodness that didn't happen. The world was saved, I don't think how badly I drive my car, but it was a natural thing that I wanted, but I can't think of any other children around me, actually male or female, who are really interested. I mean, do you think there are other preconceived images about whether it is or isn't? So the, the, um, I've, I've, I joined Aer Lingus in the depth of the COVID um, pandemic, so we weren't doing much flying at that point. Um, and, I, and I love the business. And one thing that maybe it's unique to Aer Lingus is that brand has so much resonance in Ireland. Um, if you think Ireland, you think Guinness and you think Aer Lingus. Um, and so actually it's been high up on people's awareness. Um, I think for my, looking at the last two years, the industry itself has been through such a torrid time um, that I just think we, we do need to, as an industry, get our mojo back and get, uh, get people uh, wanting to come in. It's had, a, it's had bad press as an industry over the summer. I think collectively we need to get over that. Um, and, and the bit that I look at when I think about COVID, if it showed us anything, it's how important flying really is. Um, not just for the early stages of the pandemic where we had you know, moving essential goods and, and cargo and food and medicines, but actually when people couldn't travel to see each other, uh, to see family, to, to do business, um, I think the world was a poorer place for it. So uh, I think we should be all shouting out about this is an industry that everybody, regardless of background, should want to come into and can have a fabulous career in. And Marianne said... So so um, maybe one thing I should mention is that um, we, as a group, operate in regions of the world where um, uh, paying for a pilot license or training as a pilot is not necessarily affordable. So what we've done, we've opened what we call a cabin crew to captain program, where we do finance the training for our cabin crew 
who can keep working as cabin crew and at the same time start training uh, to become pilots. And, uh, and this, this is working very well. This is, of course, facilitating uh, the, the, the financing of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of, the, uh, of the training. Um, and also because um, still, I believe, uh, for young girls, again, it's not natural necessary to become a pilot. And, uh, and for sure, uh, this program is great. But there is much more we should do in the longer term to, uh, to be speaking at schools uh, with younger um, girls. Uh, so that it becomes a, a girls and men job, not only a men job. But uh, with this initiative, it's already uh, helping wom more women access the job. Okay. I think um, a couple of years ago, before COVID, we had some children from one of the local schools in Luton, which is a very diverse community, mm -hmm. come into the hangar. And they got to go on, on an aircraft that was being stripped back. And uh, there was two little girls, they were about 11, um, sat in the pilot, uh, the captain and first officer's seat. And I walked up behind them and I said, oh, do you want to be a pilot? And this girl looked at me so disdainfully and said, no, of course not, I want to be an engineer. And I thought, how wonderful was that? Because you know, naturally I was just thinking female pilot and she was, no, you know, I'm doing these types of subjects and this is what I want to do. And I think you're absolutely right. You've got to get into schools. You know, you've got to have a visualization of females in, um, in different positions in the organization. I think, uh, you know, picking, picking up on your point, I fell in love with aviation many years ago. I think over COVID times, people have fallen a little bit out of love with aviation. And a lot of people have left the industry because they couldn't afford to stay in the industry um, because of some of the support ne mechanisms that are in place or not. Um, and I think we've got to get people back, but we've got to be able to visualize. It's an industry for all different types of people. You know, you don't have to be a middle-class white male um, to be in our industry. When I started, it was pilots that ran airlines. Surprisingly, other people can. And it doesn't have to be that. Look at the change over the years. Let's hope we can change it even further. But you've got to bring jobs alive, whether it's in aviation finance, whether it's in you know, fleet management, whether it's in sustainability. You've got to be able to visualize it for people. And we need to storytell what those jobs are. And I, I just thought uh, the point you made there about specifically being at Luton, and I know Luton has got a, a large Asian community Asian. around it. And I was thinking then, is that another challenge in itself? I mean, you, you've touched on it already, but to break through community thinking. I mean, certain nationalities, they want their, especially Asians, maybe want their sons to be doctors or lawyers. Maybe they expect their daughters to get married and be simply staying at home. Uh, it's, it's that extra work to do? So I you think get great businesses like are representative of the communities that they work in, but also, you know, their, their customers as well. Mm -hmm. And our customers are, you know, people from Luton, and yeah. our business should be representative of that. We, we don't just have Luton, we have bases, you know, across Europe. But I think if you, if you came into our offices of Luton, you would, in Luton, you would see that representation, but not necessarily at the more senior levels. And we were at a conference last, last week and we were just talking much more about that. And it's great that these topics are on the agenda. So, you know, in a couple of years' time, you might not be having a conversation with um, a group of women, you might be having a conversation about something slightly different. Now, Dawn, you mentioned earlier about TUI being essentially a German group, you know, obviously yeah. it's a pan-European group. I wanted to ask all of you about national culture in terms of male psyche in relationship with women in, in work. Starting with you, Dawn, I mean, is there a difference that you see, you're, you're a Brit, do you see that difference in terms of say, the German mentality about women, opportunities overall, and senior positions in particular? Not, you know, there are naturally um, in Germany, Germany and the UK have many similarities and you know it's, it's pretty much the same situation. Yeah. I don't see it as significantly different, I have to say. You know, on our main supervisory board or one of the most senior boards in our business, we have two female leaders. So um, no, I don't, I don't particularly see it in that, that way. How about France? France, I, I work a lot in France and I would have imagined it would have been more traditional uh, chauvinistic, if you like, and I, I was talking with you before we began, uh, another uh, woman I know in the industry who once said to me, coming from an Air France background, there were only one or two senior roles you'd be able to get as a woman. You wouldn't be considered for anything else. You've been there and you're away from it. Yeah, well, I, I think 
culture is what attracted me uh, when I joined Wiz uh, and what impacted me as well and has still impacting me today. Um, we're, Air France is a, is a French airline, but, but has a, a great culture and a diverse culture as well. But Wiz um, was born in 2004, established in Hungary, first flight from Katowice in Poland to Luton, um, and has grown in, in, in different continents now. Um, Wiz is 90 different nationalities. It's 6,500 employees, but 90 different nationalities, uh, four airlines. And, uh, and this is what makes us um, a great culture to, uh, to work in, but also very agile in terms of um, doing business wherever we do business. Um, so I think as, as a woman, um, um, yeah, fighting to, uh, to, uh, to progress in, in a male-dominated environment, I think the fact that we have this very diverse culture is actually helping because this is a culture of openness, this is a culture of, uh, of uh, yeah, understanding each other uh, very, very well. So, uh, um, um, yeah, and, and that's a great differentiating factor for people we want to recruit uh, and have very attracted to this as well. And Lynn, I mean, you've worked in airlines which have uh, different national cultures. I've, I've worked with, I work with the Brits, I've worked with the Irish, I've worked with the Americans, I've worked with the Spaniards. Spanish. And I think the main difference I see is that um, the Spaniards are just permanently happy. And I think it's because it's a lot warmer in Spain than it is in, <laughs> uh, uh, in the northern end of Europe. So that's the main difference I've noticed. No, nothing across cultures. You, you've been in IAG, BA, Air Lingus. Yeah, I think it just comes back to the overall theme of um, different perspectives in the room makes for a healthy organization. And I think, I think one of the reasons IG has been really successful is because it has, uh, it's, it's had a model that's been different from the other consolidated uh, groups. Um, and I think it's brought different perspectives from different nationalities. So I just come back to having a mix in the room is, is going to build for a stronger business. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough role models? You know? For women who are out there in the industry, could we use more? We need more, and we'll get there. <laughs> what do we need to get there? What's the extra push, would you say? We have them, but we need to make them more visible. Yeah. How, how would you do that in terms of publicity or acting as spokespeople for the airline? Being here? Yeah, yeah. I think we can all do things in our organizations um, uh, in terms of encouraging women to keep moving in their careers, to get out of their comfort zone, um, to um, try new jobs, to not feel uh, underconfident in going for a new role. Um, and I think the more we do that and couple that with the kind of STEM type um, activity you mentioned, um, but also tackling unconscious bias, which is inherent in most organizations, it's, a, it's a, the usual stuff that other sectors have done. Mm -hmm. And maybe aviation is just a little bit slower to have um, cracked it. But I think we're heading in the right direction. And in terms of you know, the actual leadership, you know, the C-suite, the CEO post, do, do you think that um, you know, there, are some, there are some in the industry, put it this way, I know we were talking about this before, so I'm trying to pick my words in the right way. There are some male members of the industry at senior level who do not think women should be in the hot seat. Is that still a battle that needs to be fought? Because maybe it is only a, a man's job. It's only a man who can do it. Is that, has that battle got to still be played out to chip away? I don't really see it in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I haven't experienced that. My sense is um, any job in aviation can be done by anybody from any background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the more that that happens in reality, the more it'll be, become normal and that kind of question won't be needed in 10 no. years' time. Yeah. Just because time is running against us, I'm sure we could talk much more about the specifics of uh, women and your roles in the industry. But I do want to ask all of you some technical stuff. It's more my comfort zone about your respective uh, airlines. But weave in probably aspects of yourselves as women doing these jobs. We've all touched on coming out of COVID. That's been a big challenge. And Lynn, if I start with you, I think you came into Aer Lingus as CEO in the middle of COVID and Ireland has touched really severely, really badly locked down. Aer Lingus, like many airlines, had to let people go. 
how did you find that? The management of the, pe the people side of it, an airline that was damaged, uncertain, people didn't know where their futures were. How did you get through that with, you, with the people working for you to give them hope? And it was probably the most bizarre introduction to a new job I could imagine. Um, I met my team on Teams um, and we had an airline that was losing a million a day. Um, and all the people weren't allowed to do what they would find natural to do, which is look after customers, fly aircraft, um, and, uh, and all the things that comes of being part of that family and that, that airline environment. So it was a pretty odd start. Um, uh, we knew we had to stay solvent, get through it. Um, but actually being able to look ahead to when skies were opening up. And of course, at Aer Lingus, we only we are a short haul airline and we're a North American airline. So we, didn't, we weren't flying to South America, we weren't flying to other long haul markets that were open. Mm -hmm. So our long haul market was effectively closed. Um, and this is why the summer we've just had was so important. We, we, we knew we needed a big summer, we anticipated a big summer, we planned for a big summer, and thank heaven we had a good summer and a big summer. So, um, it was, uh, but it was the, the judgment of, of when to take the bet to put the capacity back in um, and to get the training and get the recruitment going so that we, uh, we could fly if the demand was back. And luckily, as you said in your slides earlier, your know, leisure demand in particular came back so strongly. And luckily, we were able to, to kind of take advantage of that for the summer we've just had and the results we just announced. Uh, it's just so, such a relief to be back doing what we should be doing. And uh, we wouldn't want to go through the COVID period again. And also in the middle of that uh, challenge, and given that Ireland was so locked down, you took opportunities outside of Ireland. I mean, the UK island market's long been you know, bedrock for Aer Lingus, naturally, but you opened up a new base in the UK, in Manchester. Is that something that you think was, was that an opportunity that came because of COVID or is it something you would have done anyway? I, I think we, we were looking anyway because Aer Lingus has got a good cost base um, it was, uh, we knew we were bringing in narrow-bodied aeroplanes for long haul, uh, which allow us to operate thinner markets. So we were looking more broadly at um, uh, what we could do on the long haul, with the long haul fleet. Um, we did see an opportunity at Manchester as capacity came out of that market. And we've got a brand that not only is well known in Ireland, it's well known in the UK, but it's also got a real um, diaspora link to the US so we opened up the base and that was something that gave us a real buzz actually the yeah. the teamwork that goes involving starting up the new airline it was a UK AOC uh, getting all of the functions that required to run that airline and all the recruitment and then getting the first flight up in the air which was not when we expected because mm -hmm. the US didn't open up when we expected um, but uh, we felt we were well placed to get that market going and it's been doing really well we've restarted uh, Bar Barbados is our winter route, um, but we've got New York is doing really well, uh, and Orlando as stable routes, and I hope we'll go that base. And cautiously optimistic about next year from the sound. I'm, of it, I'm optimistic about next year. Yeah. Marion, I mentioned in my opening as well, although you've lost money because of the fuel situation, Wiz has been expanding phenomenally, and particularly in the UK, for which is your area of focus. I mean, uh, you yes, already so were a big player, but. I, I joined with UK in July 2021, so I had to do three PCR tests to, uh, to come. I had to quarantine on my first week in the UK simply because I'm French. Um, and uh, and uh, the good thing as well is that the WIS group never stopped flying during the pandemic. WIS UK did for four weeks uh, in March 2020, but recovered quickly. Of course, limited operations, but we kept the machine working all the time. And, uh, and yes, after September, October 2021, there were ups and downs, but we acquired uh, slots in Gatwick, uh, which accelerated the expansion, and we doubled our size in the last one year, which is also explained in, uh, in, 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 in those results, because we've, we've kept Invested expanding and, yeah. and investing. So just this year, I recruited 450 cabin crew, and uh, yeah, we keep expanding. So. Uh, and I mean, you, uh, Gatwick is still a big ambition, isn't it? You've opened a, a base of, is it five aircraft there this year? But I think Joseph Ferrari said before, you could imagine 20. Uh, I could imagine you having more. I can imagine even more than that. <laughs> 
when do you think that's going to happen? Is it going to depend on getting slots? Well, it depends on, on how fast we can acquire yeah. slots because uh, this is a constrained uh, operation. But uh, we, are, we are keeping our eyes extremely open. And operationally, I mean, you had a bit of a difficult summer, you know, a lot of cancellations and delays like everybody. It's the worst behind you now, would you say, Matt? Yeah, this is behind us, and I feel very sorry for each of our customers uh, and even for our staff who got disrupted during the, during, during the summer. It's, it's, it's normalized, and uh, we are preparing our winter, our Christmas operations because we want to deliver reliable operations for Christmas and, of course, for next summer. Some of the, uh, some of the issues will not be completely solved, like ATC, for example, mm -hmm. but at least what we control will control it. And some parts of the UK pulling back, sadly, uh, uh, Doncaster, what is it called, Robin Hood Airport, yeah. actually closing. Uh, Wiz was the last big customer to pull out of that. So. Yeah, so the, the, the airport closed on the 31st of, uh, of October, mm. and the, uh, the operations which we had into Doncaster have moved to Leeds Bradford now. Okay. And uh, also on the TUI side of things, again, you, you had known as like a, a prestige European leisure group, but you got some bad flack, Dawn, didn't you, in terms of a summer? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, in my 34 years and definitely 20 managing the operation, it was the most difficult mm -hmm. summer ever. And I think you're absolutely right to point out, you know, for our people in the aviation industry, they don't set out to fail. They want to do the very best. And what I saw was a huge amount of resilience in, in our teams, you know, trying to keep everything going, because the last thing you want to do is delay somebody's start or finish to their holiday. And we are a leisure group, um, so, you know, we are taking people on holiday, and they've saved up a, a lot for that. So. Um, things, are, things are definitely improving. I think we've got some homework to do over the winter. Um, and I think we need to really make sure that we get ourselves into the best possible state going into next summer. But I think it goes back to what I was talking about on resourcing. Um, us and our service partners need to make sure they've got those resources and how can we attract those people to industry. And, you know, because you in particular, you are in charge of the operational side of the business. Yeah. I was aghast, you know, sometimes if someone looked at some airports, not necessarily ones that you're flying to, but certainly Lynn would fly to, like Heathrow, we had capacity caps, we had them elsewhere, Amsterdam, Schiphol. I don't know exactly what was going on, but it seemed to me there should have been a better dialogue earlier between different partners, airports, airlines, handling agents. It didn't look like that was happening enough. I don't, I, it might not have looked like from the outside. I can absolutely assure you, as I'm sure my colleagues will, um, there are lots of discussions going on. There were a lot of discussions going on. I think there may have been um, some parties traveling a little bit in hope. And the last time I looked, hope isn't a plan. Um, so, you know, the numbers were shown and we saw some positive numbers, but it's whether you can actually turn that into people who can do the job. So just on a sheet of paper saying I've got 500 people, if they haven't got an ID to work airside at an airport or they're not trained to do the task that you need them to do to push an aircraft back, that's where things started to unravel. And I think um, this summer really opens up across Europe, not just in the UK, how much do you personally want to control in aviation and how much do you want to outsource? Um, because, you know, there's a bit of an asymmetrical risk if you outsource too much of it. And we saw some of that, um, I think, this summer. I think, you know, we operate out of Amsterdam. We've got a Dutch airline, and that has been an incredibly, incredibly eye-opening experience. Um, just to see the whole of that airport collapse, basically. And that wasn't, you know, it wasn't to do with our handling agents. That was more the airport itself, an airport that I've probably always put on a bit of a pedestal. So, you know, you, you, you just never know what the next black swan is going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dublin's had a lot of problems too, hasn't it? It's your, your main base. Dublin had a, a wobble at the beginning of the summer season. Um, well, you mentioned Amsterdam there. We, so at Aer Lingus, we, we said in October last year that we were going for 90% of 2019 capacity. We went into the summer with the aeroplanes, the crew, to have 90% of 2019 capacity and some buffer. Um, but within a, within a week, it became apparent how fragile the whole European system was. And you mentioned Amsterdam. Every time we sent an aircraft into Amsterdam, it wasn't coming back um, for, for hours and hours and out. hours after it was due to come back. And, uh, and so even if you, you have a plan uh, and you have some buffer, 
by the time uh, the, the, the integrated network aspects of European aviation, uh, and that's before we get into transfer traffic across, across the transatlantic as well, um, it very quickly meant that the plans were, uh, were creaking at the seams and, and the aeroplanes, the crew, were all out of position um, and it just showed up the fragility of the whole system. Now, we're, we're beyond the peak now, so my hope and my expectation is that uh, every player in the system will use the relative off-peak to regroup, um, to recruit and to get um, to get everything ready for, for the next time that we start to build up the, the volumes again. And do, do you think that, that um, there's any way that airlines can keep more staff on than was the case this time around? I mean, obviously, I, I, I talked about airlines having no revenue for a couple of years, and obviously you can't pay what you don't have. But is there something different that could be done? I mean, Ryan, Ryanair is just, you know, Michael Leary, not surprisingly, today, talking up that, oh, Ryanair was the best prepared, we kept more people on. They did have deep pockets, but is that something that all airlines could do better? We, we actually kept the re employment relationship with the vast, vast majority of our staff. Right. However, their take home pay was seriously affected. And when you said what was a difficult part going into the job, it was knowing that there were people who had been employed with Aer Lingus for such a long time yeah. and they were, you know, their personal finances were struggling. Um, uh, and that affects how, you know, affects all aspects of life when where they're in such a difficult position. So we did actually keep the employment relationship, but it was, it was a tough, and I just, I come back to, I hope we never have to go through that again. Mm. Marianne, is that similar for you? Yeah, so we, we also had the staff for this summer and the buffer for normally disrupted operations. But what happened is not normal. Um, in our plan, for example, there was no um, melting runway in Luton, and it happened on the 18th of July. So. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of, of, I think everything which could happen this summer did happen uh, and, uh, and, and we faced it, uh, but, uh, but uh, we, we all lessons learned, I would say. Uh, I think the, the, all the pieces of the puzzle were there before March 2020, uh, 2022. And, uh, and unfortunately, we, we, we didn't have time to try to put them together. Uh, we just went into the summer, we went into Easter, and this is how it all started, terminal reopening, operations restarting. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of learnings. And we're nearly out of time, so I'm gonna try to do the impossible and talk about one of the most serious subjects in the space of three or four minutes, sustainability and the environment. Um, all of you, you know, as airlines and as uh, senior representatives of those airlines are trying to do something. We don't have the, the, the solution yet in terms of aviation emissions, but tell me a bit brief, briefly about what you're doing so far and what I'm trying to lead you into. I know all of you have got very modern aircraft fleets. So Lynn, do you want to start off as a few highlights of what Aer Lingus is doing in terms of uh, in terms sustainability? Of sustainability yeah. So um, look, first thing I'd say, aviation is completely a force for good and we need to decarbonize. Um, I'm optimistic because I think there is now a pathway that we can see to net zero. Um, now that pathway will take some time. Um, you mentioned new aeroplanes. Uh, we've just taken some 50% um, quieter, 20 plus percent less fuel burn. Um, so it's a step in the right direction, but ultimately it goes beyond technology. You know that the new tech can make a difference on short, short haul. Um, but as you mentioned on your slides earlier, long haul is going to require sustainable aviation fuel. The US are doing well there. They're getting uh, their policy environment, their incentive scheme is encouraging SAF production. I think Europe needs to catch up and change its policies to encourage SAF production here as well. Um, and I think uh, in the meantime, verifiable carbon offset is going to be important. So I think we've got the components to get to net zero, we now need to collectively get on with it across all of the stakeholders that need to work together to get there. And Marion, the aircraft type that Lynn alluded to, Airbus aircraft that you have an Airbus fleet and also a big order book. We do have a big order book of 450 aircraft. And yes, I think sustainability is a journey made of different phases uh, with SAF, with hydrogen at some point, but today is the technology that can already help us. Um, if you take with air, for example, uh, 
if all the airlines in Europe would operate the same sort of fleet as we operate, the, the, the carbon emission would reduce by 34% from one day to the other. And uh, at the end of this financial year, half of our fleet will be a new engine technology. So uh, this, is, this is really what we invest into because we believe that this is um, the way we can uh, be on this sustainability journey, which once again will be a long one and will be composed of different phases. And do you both uh, feel optimistic having Airbus aircraft? Airbus of the two big manufacturers is the one who says by middle 2030s we should have a hydrogen powered Airbus. Uh, do you hear on, in your talks uh, with the manufacturers enough that makes you optimistic that could actually happen? Yeah, we've actually partnered. We partnered with Airbus to, uh, to work together on this, uh, on this new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it's 2030, I cannot say a date precisely, but this is uh, what the, really the direction we're taking with the, uh, with the manufacturer today, yes. Do you share that optimism? Well, I'll just come back to the something like 80% of the emissions from aviation comes from uh, the long haul flying. Uh, and I don't see that technological um, uh, changes mm -hmm. overcoming that challenge for long haul. Yes. And that's where the sustainable aviation fuel really comes in. And we have to get a sustainable aviation fuel industry. But as we're looking at you know, creating jobs, and you know, it's a, there's a new industry there ready to be created. Mm -hmm. um, and we now need to, as I said before, get on with it. Well, and that's going to be required for long haul. There's two things, as you said, isn't it? It's, it's the, the technological resolving the problem of emissions, but recognizing the force for good of aviation in parallel, the two, two have got to go together. I think aviation is essential and we have to decarbonize it. And uh, as I said, I think we have the pathway now. Mm -hmm. We need to collectively get on with it. And Dawn, too, in di different aircraft, you're Boeing orientated, yeah. but you've got the most modern Boeings. Uh, yeah. What is Tui's perspective on so, that? So, I mean, very much like, like my colleagues here, you know, we are very much looking at new aircraft. Um, we've got a 787, 737 MAX fleet, um, and we've just ordered some Embraers as well. So, you know, having new generation aircraft that have fewer emissions, super. Um, I think the SAF piece is a really interesting piece. We've just signed a deal with SEPSA um, to start, you know, investigating what we can do there. And we're about to launch a new sustainability strategy. For us, we are more than just an airline because we're a large mm. global tourism business. So that force for good about travel in general is really high on our agenda. You know, the destinations, our people, what we take to um, countries and, and what we bring. Um, and leaving a positive footprint behind. So there's a lot of work going on, but we're at the beginning of this journey. And, and maybe the industry needs it. to talk up that, uh, that force for good in tourism. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, yeah. I did a holiday earlier yeah. this year where the, the country concern talking to a lot of the locals, most of them have been out of work for nearly two years, I, living I, on next I, to nothing. I remember many years ago, you know, we used to do a direct flight from Mombasa in Kenya um, to London, and we pulled off that route, you no know, flowers from that particular area came into the UK, and guess what happened? Those people didn't have a job at the end of it. And, you know, we need to forget that, you know, forget, we do sometimes, apologies, forget some of the, the things that are just so fundamental to those local communities that we can really help with. So it's not all bad. Well, we are officially over time. It's, it's flown by. I'm sure there's more we could talk about. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to take audience questions in this, but I just think we've been so wrapped up in, certainly I have selfishly, in trying to find out more from these women who are leaders. Uh, so thank you to all of you, Dawn Wilson, Marion Joffroy, and Lynn Embleton. Great to speak to you today. Wish you on the success of your respective airlines and hope to have you back in the future. Thank you very much, Thank all you. of you.